We're going to be in the green book this time. Some of them are got to get home before dark. I understand how that is. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air, coming after you and me, joy is ours to share. What rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise, headed for the jubilee yonder in the skies. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting, on the happy morning when we all shall Savior in the skies. Seems that now I almost see all the sainted dead rising for that jubilee that is just ahead. In the twinkling of an eye, change with them to be. All the living saints to fly to that jubilee. Oh, what singing! Oh, what shouting! On that happy morning when we all shall rise, oh, what glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the skies. When with all that heavenly host we begin to sing, singing in the Holy Ghost how the hands will ring. Millions there will join the song, with them we shall be, praising Christ through ages long, heaven's jubilee. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting, on that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in Smile. 
when you sing that song. And hard to breathe too. I don't know who that was back there. Very little hard to breathe. Five five nine before our second speaker. Five five nine. Let me go ahead and give you the song to mark for the invitation. One seventy nine. One seven nine. Now five fifty nine. There is a habitation. Somebody knows it. There is a habitation built by the living God for all of every nation who seek that grand abode. Oh, Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. start in chapter 34, but the text that I was given was Isaiah 35, and <clears throat> brother, I'm going to tell you how I got that time. When the kids, when, when our <laughs> preacher students come into, when they come to school, they come in, the very first class that they have is the Gospel of Mark, and I teach it. And now, see, Jalen had me for Mark. So if he's preaching about Mark, he doesn't do a good job. It's on him, not on me. It's all the same. Uh, now, actually, I have the first year students twice with apologetics as well. And I'm the teacher that they do, don't want. They do not want me. I don't understand why. They can come to the class of Mark every day. We open up God's Word. And we have a, a great time in studying the life of Jesus. But when class is over and the day's completed and they're about to get out and fight rush our traffic, as Jalen did, to get home, it takes him two hours to get there from where he was staying. <clears throat> I teach the Gospel of Mark. There's different ways that you can teach God's Word. I teach the Gospel of Mark by the questions that Jesus asked. Maybe you've heard a sermon or two. It could possibly even be mine that Jalen rehashed. I do not know. 
But within the Gospel of Mark, there are 42 questions that Jesus asks. Now realize that this is the first class that they had. They come in and I say, okay, here's your list. I only pick 32 of them. And I say, you have to write one page on every question that Jesus asks. You want three points like you do for a Devo on a Wednesday night at the close of the service. And on Fridays, it's due. Every week, whatever we have in a chapter that week is due. About the time you get to about chapters eight or nine, they start, there's about five or six of them. They have about ten in two chapters. And uh, they do very well the first week of this chapter. Introduction is chapter one. Second week is chapters two and three. By the third or fourth week, they are sighing and sobbing. They say, come to my class. <laughs> and there's no way that they can leave. And at the end of the quarter, you hear, and we shall come rejoicing, leaving our Mark class. <laughs> they can't wait to get out of there. Tonight, I'm sure that's why it was given to me the way it was. Tonight, as we study God's Word, I want you to know I'm respectful of people's time. I'm also respectful of the talents that we've been called to share to edify the saints, and uh, I want you to know that as we proceed into this, I'm going to tell you what they tell you at Disneyland. Keep your hands, legs, arms inside the lesson at all times until it comes to a complete stop. In chapter 34, the background of Isaiah 35, chapter 34 denotes a judgment upon nations, particularly Edom. Uh, who set themselves up against Yahweh, against Jehovah. In chapter 35, it conveys a contrast to the happy future of the people of God. We just sang a song about Zion. I would really like marching to Zion, but that was fine. Because we're looking forward for a heavenly habitation. In the text of chapter 35, we'll get to it in a minute, I want you to know that God's people have always had their ups and downs. It doesn't matter if you were in Jerusalem on the first Pentecost after the resurrection and the Holy Spirit comes in power upon the apostles and Peter and the other apostles now are up there preaching. That was great times. There was rejoicing. There was people uh, coming to a knowledge of what they needed. There were people accepting Jesus as Messiahship. But that same Peter, over in his epistles, he wrote Suffering Christians. And he wrote them, he says, if any of you suffer, you be sure that you suffer as a Christian. And glorify God in that. God's people have always had ups and downs. In the Old Testament, sometimes it's because of their faithfulness. Sometimes it's because the choices that other nations around Israel, God's chosen people of the Old Testament, made. And how it affected them. Jesus says, as he walked this earth on the very last night before he was betrayed, in the Gospel of John, the 16th chapter, verse 30, uh, 30 and following, specifically verse 33, be of good cheer. That's how he ends. Boy, wouldn't it be nice if he began the verse like that? And if you know John 16, 33, it says, in this world you're going to have tribulations. In this world you're going to have troubles. You're going to have cares. But he doesn't leave it at that. He says, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. He was looking in the future toward what was going to be. He was looking in the future toward his resurrection. He was looking into the future. And you say, well, Roy, how do you know that? Because Jesus on the road to Jerusalem, he says, you know, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm telling you, disciples, this is what's going to happen. They're going to, they, I'm going to be betrayed. And they're going to deliver me up to the chief priests and they're going to kill me. But on the third day, I'm going to come back. Nobody, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. I willingly lay it down. And if I lay it down, I have the power to pick it back up again. It's okay if I pace, right? Breathe. Okay. I have the power to pick it back up again. I hope that we understand, and I know that we do, on all levels, what has happened since 2020. 
If you don't think that you don't live in a troubled world, I don't know where you've been for the last 36 months. <laughs> I was thankful to keep gas for 384. <laughs> Some of y'all are older than me. I can remember when it was 39 cents a gallon. And I'm paying and 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 384 for it now. But Jesus says, if I, I have the power to lay down my life, I lay it down, I'm going to pick it back up again. That's why in the Gospels, when it says that Jesus gave up his ghost, the literal language there in the Gospel says it, he gave his spirit permission to leave. Yeah, wow. You don't think he's not in control of the situation? Come on, Lord. The way of holiness. The prophet here, Isaiah, and I want you to I want you to know I have I have three kids. They're all in college age or they're out and they have one has their own uh, uh, two of them have their own families now. But I want you to know that I saw Shrek more times than I needed to. <laughs> but there's some good stuff in Shrek. Because people are like onions. They have layers. I'm going to tell you this. The Word of God. Okay. Brother, brother you don't, don't, don't pick up a song, but throw it at me. The Word of God is like a layer. It has layers to it. You can pick up God's Word, and you can read that you need to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, yeah. and live a faithful life. And you know what? You can go to heaven. But you can dig deeper. And the deeper you dig, the more you'll find. And the wellspring from God's word will never run dry on you. Now, in this section of scripture, chapter 35, this way of holiness has that same connotation about it. Because I believe there's at least three layers here. The prophet has described Edom as a burning desert, fit only for wild and unclean animals that inhabit such places. Look at chapter 34, uh, verse, uh, oh, verse 11, last part of it. It's a plumb line of emptiness. Uh, verse 14, desert creatures shall meet with wolves, hairy goats. You, you have not uh, monsters there. You have tree snakes. What lives in the desert? Wild animals. And he's saying, Edom is in that burning place. You set yourself up against God, and you set yourself up as a wild thing in a desolate place, in a wilderness without God. The description is not only of a land forsaken by the Lord, but it's also of a soul without God, of a profane, unspiritual person, in contrast to the dreadful picture of Edom in chapter 34, when we get to 35, when we get to 35, Israel, as it were, is passing through a wilderness of trials, of devastation, but will someday be glorious. When, when we're talking about Israel, we're talking about the people of God. Isaiah is talking about God's people. The later. We're walking through a troubled, fallen world, church. Amen. But one day we're going to come through this and one day we'll be glorious. It'll be glorious for us. If, if not, then why don't we just sing the song we did about heavenly portals and angelic army singing. Oh, lovely Zion. Preach, Lord. Representing the beauty of a soul that was formerly de desolated by sin but has been redeemed. Wilderness through which a redeemed one comes singing into Zion. It's a spiritual desert that led them from captivity, Babylonian captivity, as it became eventually to becoming the Messiah. And as Jesus walked the earth, Jesus' mission was a restoration of the fellowship that was broken with God in the garden between man and God because of sin. We have one mediator, the man, Jesus Christ, 
That was his goal. That was his mission. That was his work. That was his job. And he finished it. And he completed it. And when he completed it, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Amen. We live in a time today of grace, but of restoration. But I would submit to you that although chapter 35 of Isaiah has been fulfilled in its completeness, it foreshadowed a day for God's people that is still coming. It lays ahead. I believe the prophecies of Isaiah 35 have already been fulfilled. But it foreshadowed another time. It foreshadowed when God's people once again would sing a new song. Look at, uh, we're going to go right into the text now. <laughs> what did you say, brother? All that's introduction. Here we go. <laughs> Verse 1. The wilderness and the desert will be glad. The Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. The description of the desert seems to fit best in religious life, both of the Jew and maybe of the Gentile as well, which becomes like a desert, uh, a wilderness, a waste and a void. That's where the crocus is bloom. Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 1. The desert shall produce both a beauty and a moral fragrance. The point is that an unsightly spiritual life will come to a beauty of character and a sweet incense of spirit. That can only be had through the grace and through the blood of Jesus Christ. It can only happen if you're sanctified. It can only happen if you're set apart. Amen. Because if you're not set apart, you know what? You're going to be like the desert in chapter 34. Because you're not part of God's people. Yeah. Chapter 35 is for God's people and God's people alone. The former wilderness, verse 2, uh, will blossom uh, profusely. Rejoice with rejoicing and shout with joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. That former wilderness, that desert, will now blossom abundantly with a song, a picture of spiritual beauty and gladness that the desert sings about the Lord. Because he affected the areas of transformation. Could you be what you are in Christ today without the good Lord? Nope. No. Uh, where I'm from, there's an older gentleman there. He's since gone on to be with the Lord, I trust. And he always ended his prayer with the apostolic admonition, we love you because you love us first. Verse 3, encourage the exalted and strengthen the feeble knees and the slack hands. It's an exhortation to strengthen the weak hands and the feeble tottering knees. Weak hands and feeble knees are symbols of unbelief and defeat. When the world becomes too much, when it becomes way down upon you. I'll get the link over here, right? I'm on the TV camera. <laughs> when the world becomes too much for you, what's going to happen? You're going to start shaking in your knees. I coached for 26 years. I can't tell you how many times I went to the weight room and I saw guys just load up four or five hundred pounds of squash and stuff. But you know what they did when they got near their breaking point? Their knees started to shake. Verse 3 is an admonition for God's people to take care of each other. If you see someone who's struggling with something, it's your responsibility, and it's my responsibility, to help them get through what they're getting through. Yeah. And you say, Roy, are you sure? I'm positive. Yeah. Because when Cain killed Abel, he said, yeah. Who am I? Am I my brother's keeper? You know the implication of that? Everyone is layers. You're either your brother's keeper or you're your brother's killer. Hmm. And I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. We have, I spend, I spend most of my time as an elder trying to make sure that we can still get the people in the doors. I, I send five, six text messages every Sunday morning because somebody's out of town, because somebody's sick. You know, I missed you today. Where, where were you? You know, t touching base, keeping sure. That's fine. I can do that. But it's not just an elder's responsibility. 
Amen. It's not just the preacher's responsibility. Preach. It's all of us. It's all of us together. Say to those with an anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. He's going to take care of his people. You go and you read the writings of Peter. The Lord knows how to reserve in judgment those who need it, and he knows how to deliver the righteous. So if you're the angels who didn't keep your former domain, or if you're a righteous lot that the sin vexes your soul, hang out your phone and go through your new speed. Does that vex your soul? Does that trouble you? It should because we, as Brother Gideon was talking about, we should want to have a, 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 a desire for righteousness and a hatred of sin. Mm -hmm. And we get as close as we want to to sin and really? try to stay as far away as we can from righteousness because we think it's so fun. Come on, Roy. Hey, you say, well, how do you know? How, you know what, where's your proof? Where's the proof of the pudding, Gavin? Why don't you turn to Psalm 84, verse 11 and 12. For God is a sun and a shield, and no good thing does he hold from those who walk uprightly. That's a blessing to you from the storehouses that uh, Brother Yudi is talking about. But it is all, he said, if it's good, I'm going to give it to you. But if it's not, I'm going to keep it from you. And we've got people. <laughs> I, I, saw on the, I, I saw on the sign coming down here. 281. The lottery was $440 million. I know somewhere there's somebody praying, oh, let this be my number tonight. Pretty much. Let me tell you something. If you can't be happy with... I don't even have a nickel in my pocket. Yeah, I have a nickel in my pocket. If you can't be happy with 30 cents, $440 million ain't going to do you no good. Because happiness is a state of mind. It has nothing to do with how much you have in the bank. It has no, nothing, well, however much you have in the new. Happiness is a state of mind. And if that state of mind is focused on God, you know what? You're going to be happy in spite of your circumstances. And if your happiness is not found in God, it doesn't matter what you do. You will never be happy because, because Solomon wrote that God has said eternity in the hearts of man. And what do we do as mankind today? We fill it up with everything. We fill it up with sex. We fill it up with alcohol. We fill it up with drugs. We fill it up with, with uh, recreation. We fill it up with this body. We fill it up with pizza. <laughs> Don't let you Dr. Pepper. We'll do anything to fill the hole that's in us. But the Ecclesiastes writer says, it don't matter what you do. You're still going to have that hole because eternity is set in your heart. And I'm telling you this, if eternity is set in your heart, the only thing that's going to fill it up is an eternal being. Because everything else is transitory. And it will go. But God will stay. Come on, Lord. God will stay. God's people are now in a new relationship. With that new relationship, there's a new responsibility. Each individual is to encourage their fellow travelers. The heart is the workshop in which all of our deeds are wrought and brought forth. They worship me with their lips. Uh -huh. Their hearts are far from me. Why? What did Jesus do when he looked over Jerusalem? He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one that stoned the prophets and stoned us. You kill prophets and stone the ones that sent to you. How often I have longed to gather you together as a hen gathers a chicks, but you were not willing to come to me. You were not willing to be gathered into the house where God could take care of you. How sad that is. That God's own people sometimes say, No, Lord, I don't need it today. I don't want your blessing. Let me tell you something. You let a storm come through? Like, 
and, and trampolines start going through the air. And you watch how quickly religious people show up. Look how quickly God's people change. I need the Lord every day, and you do too. In the, in the, in the, 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 I'm sorry, I'm getting old. I can't find words like I used to. And the tragedy is, there's so many people that think that they can live without God in their life. Without God on their heart. And without God guiding and protecting them. And helping them on a daily basis. Too many people. Fear is a sign of unbelief. Today's fears of spiritual failure, of Satan's power, of economic collapse, of moral defeat, and a plethora of other fears that we have. And brother just did a good job on that. We need not fear this world. We need only the fear of the Lord. The Lord is at hand. The Lord will avenge the wrongs done to his people. He will render judgment on those who afflict his people. And at the same time, he will provide salvation for those who are disposed to accept his terms. Uh, look at uh, verse 5. And the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. If you go to Matthew, the 11th chapter, chapters, uh, verses 1 through 6 or so, you have the scenario there of John the Baptist. And John's at the end of his life, and he wants to make sure that he's done all it. So he sends his disciples, and he, he, he questions Jesus. They, they question Jesus' disciples. And he said, go tell John. Go tell John. The eyes of the blind are open. The dead speak. And you can hear. The poor had the gospel preached to them. John did what he was supposed to do. But do you have questions about what you're supposed to do? Do you have questions about his leadership, Christ's leadership? If you do, it's okay. John had those questions. But I would submit to you that you'll follow Jesus if you desire to have those questions answered. Master, who else can we go to? Who else has the words of eternal life? Look at verse 6. And then the lame will leap like a deer. I saw five of them between 581 and here. <laughs> the tongue of the dumb will shout for joy. The waters will break forth in the wilderness. And streams in the desert are the Arabah. The tongue of those who've been speechless shall sing one day. The way to Zion in the city will resound with songs of rejoicing. There'll be a sweeping change in the lives of people eternally, not just in time as we're transformed now, but eternally when we're transformed for all times. From the desert, the, the desolate wilderness in which we live, this fallen world in which we want justice, we want fairness. Got news for you, church. You're not going to get it in this world because if you couldn't get it, you wouldn't need heaven. Yeah. And yet we have people today. The young man over here, he, he, young man over here, coloring. Guarantee you. He said this word, and if you have kids and grandkids, they said it too. But, Dad, that's not fair. <laughs> hate to be like Tina Turner, but what's fairness got to do with it? <laughs> There'll be a sweeping change as people are transferred from a desert, this desolate wilderness to a garden of luxury. You think it, you, you know, this, this right here, this is God's story. Sorry. He's the hero. <laughs> can walk that whole thing. Okay, yeah, I, I figured you do as well. <laughs> I'm keep you in a seat in my classroom. Um, this is God's story. He's the hero. You know how it starts? First two chapters. You don't know how it starts. Yeah. Yeah, it's a garden. Is there sin in that garden? No. No, no there's no sin in that garden. But then you go to the last book, 
And you go to the last two chapters, and you know where you are again? You're in God's presence. In a place where there's no sin. And all the chapters in between is his story about restoring that relationship that was lost in Genesis 3. But that will continue on from Revelation 21 and onward. Verse 7, And the scorched land will become a pool and thirsty, uh, thirsty ground springs of water and the haunt of jackals is a resting place. The grass becomes reeds and rushes. Do you know that in the places of desert in the Middle East, around places where mirages kind of occur from time to time because of the geography of the land, you know what's around those places? Bones. Chapter 7 is telling us one day that empty image of a mirage will come full circle and it will be true. And there will be water there. And that water will satisfy. If you look at John 14, 4, he tells the woman at the well, if you drink the water that I give you, woman, you're never going to be thirsty again. Go over to John, the 7th chapter, verse 37 and 38. He stood up at the feast and he says, if anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me. Because he has the drink that will satisfy. Only Jesus can provide the water that transformed the arid, dry, desert life of sinners into a garden of beauty and productivity for the Father. There's no other way. He is the way to the Father. Uh, look at verse 8, 9, and 10 because this is kind of the text I was given. The highway will be there. A roadway. Notice, the, notice the, the pronoun. And it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way. And fools will not wander on it or in it or upon it. It, 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 it. The word there for highway in, in, in Hebrew is mazlul, which means a raised way. It's not a pathway. It's literally a raised up way in which you can travel on. It's a highway that leads to the city of God and the way of holiness for travelers that the only one road is in view because of the pronoun. It. They're definitive, singular pronouns. We live in a, a, a pluralistic world that says, Jesus don't know what he was talking about. He's just one way to the Father. Uh-uh. Jesus says, I am the, the way. A definitive article. There's no other way. If there was some other way, when Jesus used the admonition, when Jesus used the admonition that night in the garden, not my will but thine be done because Jewish fathers taught their children to pray like that. And if the father loved Jesus and he did, and there was some other way, that would have been it. School's out and we're done. It had to be done the way it was done. Second, Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 21 says, For God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves apart from the atoning sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. And if you want to stand before the throne, and here's your song, dressed in righteousness, not my own, the only righteousness you're ever going to be dressed in is the blood of Jesus. Because it's the only thing that sanctifies you, sets you apart, and it's the only thing that will keep you the way you need to be kept in Christ alone for God. And I believe we sang that song as well. The highway is limited to a select few. The law specifies, the law of Moses specifies two kinds of uncleanness, moral and ceremonial. The prophets gave special emphasis to the morally unclean. 
This passage here bars the morally unclean from the highway, leaving only the redeemed. There's no other, there's nobody else going to be on that highway mm -hmm. except God's folks. Sorry, I'm from East Texas. Preach. Uh, the next word there, and fools will not wander on it. That's too pretty. The word in Hebrew for fools is also a derivative of the word of evil. The evil will not walk upon it. They won't tread upon it. They can't walk upon it. Because they're not going to the city of God. 26 plus times in Proverbs, we have the fool as a despiser of wisdom, one who despises correction, one whose way is right in his own eyes. You get to verse 9, I'm going to hurry here. There's no lion. No lion will be there. In other words, there's no danger. There's no fearing what Satan can do to me because that is over with. As, as a, someone who teaches apologetics, People say, well, if I'm going to be in this restored relationship with God one day, what is to keep me from sinning in heaven? I just chuckle. Kind of busy. Yeah. Satan ain't going to be in heaven. He's in the garden. There's going to be no uncleanness. There's going to be no evil. Some purity and holiness, of which, without which, holiness, you will not see God. Amen. And if you don't think that that should be spiritually to your bone, you are sadly. We get to the climatic verse because I know that's what Jalen wants. He just wants to sing. <laughs> the ransomed of the Lord, it, it, there at the end of verse 9, the redeemed will walk there. The ransomed of the Lord will return. The Goel, the redeemed, the ransomed, the, the word there is Padah. That's a joyous description of those who pass through the wilderness of affliction and are now experiencing the delight and joy of redemption. They've exchanged sorrow and sighing which have fled away from the presence of the Lord for gladness and joy which are everlasting and shall never be taken away. It foreshadows the glory, yes, of the Messiah, prophetic of the Messianic times, but it's a foreshadowing still of a greater day that's yet to come. We are close on time. I promise you, I love you, but I want to leave you with this. The question is, are you singing and shouting or sighing and sobbing on the way to the city of Zion? If you would, turn over in your New Testaments to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. There are days when you get up, right, church? Everything's good. The kid slept all night, right? He gets up, he fixes his own cereal, Bobby gets to sleep in. There are days that are great. And then there are days when you like the Bugs Bunny cartoon, you like to crawl in the hole and pull the hole in after you. We have those days. Because this is a fallen world. And there's nothing that we can do to make life fair, to make life right, to make it come out. I'm here to tell you tonight that on your way to singing and shouting, there's going to be days of sobbing. There's going to be days, there's going to be bad times, but I'm also here to tell you tonight 
that God knows his own. And if he is, thank you, and if he has reserved punishment for those who are not his, he knows how to deliver those who are. In Luke, the 24th chapter, we have a resurrection story of two disciples. One of them is named Clopas. The other one is unnamed. They're traveling from Jerusalem to a village named Emmaus, which is about seven miles or so from Jerusalem. I know it's seven miles. Uh, and they were conversing with each other about all the things, the resurrection that had taken place, the crucifixion, the resurrection. And it came about while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. And verse 16 is probably the most <coughs> executed verse in this, in, uh, in this part of the chapter. And it's probably uh, doesn't need to be. Because if you focus on chapter 16, you miss the point. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Everybody wants to know. Well, uh, was it something miraculous on the tour of us? Or was he dressed kind of like Luke Skywalker and, and nobody could see his face or anything? Don't know. Don't care. If you're focusing on that, you miss the point. And I, I, I'm, I'll get you to the point here in just a minute. And he said to them, What are those words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood there looking sad, and their countenance had fallen. One of them named Clopas. I love this. Are you the only one in all of Jerusalem? Don't know what's going on here, Junior. <laughs> are you the only one and unaware of the things that have happened in these days? And Jesus, pulling them in, question he asked, What things? <coughs> now notice what happens. Yeah, there you go, brother in the purple shirt. I love you, man. Don't know your name, but I love you because you 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 close right here. The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty and deed and work. I'm gonna stop right there before I continue. Notice what they're doing. They're telling Jesus about Jesus. Yeah, Like Jesus needs them to define him. And they, they're, they're defining, they, oh, we're going to have a talk with, let's have a little talk with Jesus. Let's tell Jesus about Jesus. Apparently Jesus don't know what he's been doing here lately. <laughs> Who was a prophet, mighty and deed, and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified. But we were hoping, <laughs> we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. See, Clopas, this other disciple, they had a misconception about the work of the Messiah. Because that phrase, redeem Israel, is like overthrow the Romans. To set up his, his kingdom here. We were hoping that he was going to be the one. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. And also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early this morning, didn't find the body, they came saying that he had seen a vision of angels and that he was alive. And some of them, of those who were with us, went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman said, but him they did not see. Here you go. You're talking to Jesus. But they don't know where he is. You get that? They're talking with Jesus. They don't know where he is. They're still weighted down by what they think Jesus was doing. And he said to them, O foolish man, so hard to believe in all the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ and the Messiah, the anointed one, to suffer the things and to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them concerning himself and all the scripture. <coughs> And as they approached, here we go. As they approached the village where they were going, he acted as though he would go a little bit further. And they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it's going towards the evening, and the day is nearly over. And he went in to stay with them. And it came about that when he reclined at the table, now here you go, we're, we're about to get to the end of this. He reclined at the table. He took the bread and blessed it. Now before I finish, let me tell you something here. The guest has become the host because the host is the one who blessed the elements 
that was on the table in Jewish custom at dinner time at supper. They said, won't you come in and stay with us? Won't you come in? So he comes in. The guest becomes a host. And he took the bread and he blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. <clears throat> Blessed the bread, gave it to him. <clears throat> then their eyes were open. I believe that context is written for a specific reason. What it is and why it is there, I do not know. But notice when their eyes, where their eyes are open. It's after he breaks, he blesses, breaks, and breaks it, and gives it, right? And you're going to give that to me? Whoa, whoa, hold it up. right beside him. And you didn't recognize him. And I would submit to you, you do not want to be a disciple of Jesus today. And you walk your life right beside him. And never recognize him. That's lesson 24. It's not about why their eyes can see. It's about the disciples who walk with Jesus Master, he's your Lord, he's your Savior, he loves you, he means far more than words can convey. Don't think I don't hear every word. Just hold on talk so that we know Susan. Have you told him lately that you love him? I don't know if you've ever been challenged like this before or not. But I don't do it. I know that God loves you. And I know that God loves the people in this community. I know He loves the people in your way. He even loves the people who don't know you got up and left and missed a good lesson. <laughs> He wants you to walk beside him and he'll tell you who he is even though you think you know who he is. And then one day you'll be sitting at a dinner table and lo and behold there's a male friend. Boy, was I excited. Jesus. Sorry. I'm sorry I didn't wait. My favorite songwriter is uh, my mother's 85. 
Early on in his life, he wrote a lot of songs that were very, very horrible. Toward the end of his life, his songs became more than his The closer, the closer, the closer you see the day approaching of your departure, of your libation, of you leaving this earthly realm, the closer you want to be with God. Mm-hmm. And there are people here in this community and other communities that are close by and maybe you're here from them. And it's me, the closeness of God in their life. And if you're not as close as you need to be, we always give you the time to, if there's something that we can help you with, we can pray for, we love you. Remember, here to take care of yourself. It doesn't matter if you live here in Flamingo, Texas, or you live in Crane, Texas. I was thinking coming down to 281. I am not here to live in Flamingo, Texas. I was disappointed. And I remember the same song. What would you do for the same in your community? You know, it's easy for us. We get to go, we get to help other communities. I heard you, I implore you. Be your brother. And one day, we go through those gates. You're sending a shadow because you will have made it through the time of deadness. You will have made it through this wilderness of sin. Mm-hmm. And all things. Put Christ on in baptism and never become that. He needs his blood upon you. It's his righteousness that God conveys and that he sees. Without his blood, you're still in your sin. Don't do that. Don't leave tonight with anything on your mind, conscience, and soul. Let us do all that we can. Help us help you. Do all that we can do so as we leave here and go our separate ways, we can go with a clear conscience. So that one day we can all put our hands together on that one highway that seems we're marching this highway. Invitation song, Pink Pig, I believe it's how Scout and Young secure their heart. I don't know, the same way that old people secure their heart with the word of God. With his promises and his word will never come back forward. And his promises. <coughs> Always. Oh, good Father. If you need him in any way tonight, please make it known while you have stay and while we say.
me. Thank you. Boy, the bar just keeps working. Two left guys tomorrow night going to bring it. The bar just keeps being put. Every night. Every night just keeps being put. Two great lessons, fellas. Thank you very much. I pray that we take these lessons to heart. Because as he preached, and as he said, you noticed, I told you this when I started, when I put all these topics together, have you noticed something? Really? You noticed the speakers on the same night? What, what are the lessons there? <laughs> they kind of coincide with one another, right? Mm -hmm. There's a purpose for it. Because I want us to understand I want us to understand without a shadow of a doubt that in order for us to get to heaven, holiness is a must. It is a must. Like he just preached and he just preached. And y'all heard me say a million times. That line, get away from it. Get away from it. Why? What does Satan want to do? You get close to that line? The Bible tells us to draw near to God. And he will draw near to us. I believe James chapter 4 and verse number 7 tells us to resist. Not, not resist God, resist the devil. And draw near. Resist and draw near. How bad do you want to go to heaven? I'll respect the man. How bad do we want to go to heaven? We go to heaven badly. Are we longing for it? Will we give up whatever we have to give up to get there? Will we tune our lives the way we need to tune our lives to get there? Because I, I'll tell you this. Think about this. Whatever we have to give up on this side of life, means nothing compared to what heaven is for. We sing a song, heaven will surely be worth it all. Are we singing a lie to ourselves or do we truly do it? Heaven will surely be worth it all. Don't put God in the back front. Don't put him on the back front. As you heard we, this whole entire week, we all have room for improvement. Don't take these lessons and after all these preachers have gone and throw them away and put them to the side. And I'm not excluding myself. Just because I wear that title preacher doesn't make me any better. Or doesn't make, doesn't make any of these lessons not get me a prayer. Because we're all trying to get to the same place. But then we all have to do it by the same standard. There's not going to be any special privileges for anybody. But we have to look at <coughs> sin. Let me ask you this. When somebody is selling, let's say this, you ever seen somebody vomit? <coughs> how does that feel? For, how, how, do you, how do you feel for them? You don't like it, right? It's not something that you're drawn to, right? <coughs> That's how sin ought to be to us. That's how sin ought to be to us. God hates it, and therefore we ought to hate it. If we're going to be his children. Because guess what? The Bible says you are that one slave to whom you obey. Whether you want to be admitted to yourself or not. If you want to give up God for your hobbies, for your things you like to do, for, your, for the worldliness, watch what that means. Or if you give up sin 
and worldliness for God. And they both just preach, watch what heaven gets you. Do you want to be on that highway? Are you going to be, here's the question, singing and shouting because you're doing what God wants you to do? You're worshiping God the way he says? You're following his lifestyle? Or are you going to be sobbing because you're not doing what he's saying? The choice is yours. That's the beautiful thing about Christianity. God gives us all free will here. It's up to you. John, do you have a closing song? I do not. <coughs> do you want me to? Sure. All right. We, we got one. So to say, I can tell you one from memory if you don't want me.